right. Hello, hello again. If you've spent a, a lot of time in this room over the last couple of days, you've seen a lot of me, and you're probably asking, who the hell does this guy think he is? Uh, well, yesterday I thought I was a product manager, and this morning I thought I was Nathan Harvey, but right now I think I'm Dave Stanky, DevOps guy, and I'm gonna speak to you about integration testing and continuous integration and jamming those things together into continuous integration testing. Uh, we'll start with some general principles and then we'll get into a detailed example around a uh, Kubernetes microservice application, et cetera, buzzwords. So we hear this word continuous a lot in this industry. Uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous validation, continuous improvement, and continuous is awesome. I'm, I'm here to say yay on continuous. Uh, when we take these discrete heavyweight batch processes and move them into continuous small batch processes, we get good things. So first of all, we get that classic lean manufacturing benefit of small batch sizes that are increased throughput, less waste, less work in process. Secondly, we get faster throughput and more uptime as we've seen from Soder. And thirdly, it's good for people. Because think about that 48 hour deploy that starts at Friday midnight. It's not really all that fun, right? If we start acting like these important essential processes we do are actually like, kind of like our day job, it actually makes for uh, less burnout and more happy people. Now, the original continuous thing is continuous integration. And this uh, goes back, it comes out of a bad experience that people used to have. It used to be that a software team would be a lot of individual people all separately working on their code in their little offices. Now for young people, an office is this little room with walls. I, I don't know. So they would all be working independently and then after some period, it could be weeks, months, they would all put their code all together and they would do the merge. The merge. The merge was when you jammed all your code together. And when you take a bunch of code that hasn't been living together and you put it all together at the same time, you get conflicts. And so this is because while all of these people are working independently, no one has been paying attention to whether this code works together. And so putting them together, you get merge conflicts. And teams would spend weeks, even months, resolving the merge conflicts one by one, picking which one should win. Now, that made for really bad software delivery uh, schedules and also really unfun situations. So we invented continuous integration. Now, continuous integration means that you merge the software together in small increments all along the way. And conflicts can be dealt with when they're still small and cuddly uh, and manageable. Now, it's totally possible to have continuous integration and still have really bad software. Like, imagine if you resolved your merge conflicts by just randomly picking which one wins. You'll have really great throughput. Uh, you'll have really bad software. So in practice, continuous integration also means testing. We test the software that we're merging as we're merging it or before we're merging it or shortly thereafter. And all along the way throughout the software development lifecycle, we generally in, uh, up the intensity of our testing so that by the time we actually ship it, it is fully approved and ready to go. Why do all this testing? Why do we need fast feedback cycles all along the way of our development? Because Toyota does it. Um, seriously, now, how many people here have uh, an organization that is as successful as Toyota and been successful for as long as Toyota? Not bad, not bad. Most of the rest of us, let's just cargo coat what they did. But we do it for a reason, which is the reason that Toyota does it, which is that just like a Corolla, software gets more complicated as it moves. And this means that fixing bugs becomes harder and harder as it moves through the process. A lot of folks here are probably familiar with the research that's been done by NIST and IBM that shows the cost of fixing a bug that you found in production, show this on my right, <laughs> production is many times higher than the cost of fixing a bug found in dev. Uh, different studies have found different numbers. I've seen 6x, I've seen 30x, I've seen 100x. Regardless of what the x's is, it's a lot of x's. Uh, there's more data here. Uh, so the State of DevOps report, 
which everyone by now has downloaded and read, uh, is, uh, shows that continuous integration or continuous testing, as they call it, I like that term better, in fact, uh, is something that is indicative or predictive of continuous delivery. And continuous delivery predicts higher software delivery performance and higher availability. So this results in better business outcomes like higher profitability. So testing is good for business. And what are we testing? Well, here's what we call the test pyramid. At the bottom, we have a bunch of unit tests. And these are small, fast tests that we can run a lot. And they run alongside our code. And they run really quickly. And then above that, we have integration tests, where we take multiple components and make sure that they operate well together. And finally, at the top, we have a small number of end-to-end -end tests, where we exercise a full user journey across multiple steps and exercise multiple uh, aspects of the code. Um, now, what we're seeing here, oh, uh, I want to mention, uh, in the context of this talk, what we're going to do is say that tests that run within or at one microservice level are unit tests. And when we put them together, multiple services interacting, that's where we get integration tests. Now, this is an idealized test pyramid. Here's a real test pyramid. Uh, what we usually see is we've got a handful of unit tests. We have zero integration tests. And at the top, one or two really clunky, broken end-to-end -end tests that everyone just ignores because they're always read anyway. No judgment. This is hard. Integration tests are hard. Why? Well, first of all, your production runtime is not the same thing that you're writing code on, probably. It's unlikely that you can take an exact copy of your entire production runtime and jam it on to your laptop. If you can, either you don't have a lot of users yet, or you have one hell of a laptop. Cost. You don't want to spend more on running your integration test than you're going to get from shipping that software to users. Speed. The more stuff that you exercise in your tests, the slower they're going to be, and that's unfun. And side effects. It's really hard, as you get more and more complexity in what you're testing, to keep all of the effects jammed into that safe testing place. Um, as you start doing uh, more production-like testing, you probably are going to start dealing with state, which means tests to manipulate state. And then when you're done, you often have to unmanipulate the state. The stuff is hard. Microservices make it harder. Now, we all love microservices, and I'm not here to throw shade on any microservices. We have reached the end of the viability of the monolith. And microservices let us split up our monolith into independent pathways so that we can have independent teams working separately and uh, moving and iterating separately. Uh, with microservices, we, we're deliberately creating space within the code base so that light can shine in. And you have better velocity and better ability to push new features to prod. But I'm hearing something in this world that makes me kind of concerned. And that's that microservices teams are not only developing in isolation, they're testing in isolation. This is what I hear a lot. Each team is going to test their code. And they're going to test it real good. And then, through the power of microservice, they're going to independently deploy to prod. And so the first time that these uh, bits of code start interacting with each other is when they land in production infrastructure. Doesn't this kind of look like that big, nasty merge situation we looked at before? So the difference here is instead of in some UAT environment, a lot of times these things are landing together in prod where users are. OK, so this is hard. Why bother? Do we, do we have to? Let's look at the failure case. First of all, semantic versioning is one way that we use with microservices to ensure that things are working together. And this is good. Microservice, uh, semantic versioning is a, it's a contract. It's a promise. And it says that I'm going to advertise my intent of the change of my API so that your team can plan accordingly. And it's great to make that promise. But promises are meant to be broken. I can promise you backwards compatibility all day. But unless you test it, there's really no guarantee that it's going to work. Secondly, complex systems have emergent properties. These individual critters might all be perfectly well behaved, but when they all jump in the pool together, it gets crazy. With complex systems, 2 plus 2 can, equally easel, can easily equal OOM. Most important, because users experience an application. Your users don't give a hoot 
about your separation of concerns. If you've got a system with 20 microservices and 19 of them are all playing really nicely together and one of them is acting cranky, you don't have an application that's 95% working. You have an application that's 100% busted. Now here's a hot idea these days, testing in prod. So this is an idea that comes out of the observability movement. And it says that we should treat production systems as fundamentally uh, unknowable and unpredictable. It says that we should uh, put our code up into prod and then go test it and see, did it work? And if it doesn't work, we should roll it back real quick. What do folks here think? Should we stick our stuff up into prod and then say, did that work OK? Yes, yes we should. And the reason is because prod is fundamentally unpredictable. There's only one prod. Prod's where the users are, and not prod is where the users aren't. So yes, we should be prepared to observe our code in prod. Yes, we should be prepared to reconcile it really quickly. But let's be clear about what testing in prod is. This isn't a cowboy approach with a YOLO, throw it up and see what happens. Testing in prod is a disciplined approach to software development that involves hypotheses, tools for measurement, and testing. And it doesn't uh, mean, what, what part of what testing in prod recognize is that we can't pretend that we can solve all problems before we ship the software. But we can still pretend that we can solve some of them. And what we need to do is make a considered approach to how we're going to do that. It's about risk. We need to ask, what are the ramifications of a bad software release? So let's say you're uh, working on a website that makes meme GIFs, meme, M-E-M-E. E, not M-E-A-N, though often it's yes on that. So you're making meme GIFs, right? And let's say there's a problem with a request. Some, the meme looks funny. OK, what's the worst that can happen? User clicks retry. Heck, they might re click retry a couple times. It's not working. Oh, no, that person has lost some internet points, and they've wandered off. Life goes on. What if you're working on an e-commerce site? It's possible that you might take someone's money and not give them anything for it. I've done that. I've done that to a lot of people. And that becomes pretty unfun. You end up having customer support calls. You have bad reviews on Yelp. You might have chargebacks, which cost the company a lot of money. It just ends up having an actual tangible business impact. Now, what if your software runs the power grid for a hospital? We might want to think a little bit harder about how casually we treat our software quality. We need to make informed risk analyses and have that dictate how much software testing we do, when we do it, how deeply we do it. Now, this talk isn't about creating a framework for risk analysis. I wish it were. I wish I knew how to do that. Uh, in my experience, our risk analysis has typically been, ah, crap, something real bad happened. Let's try and not have that happen again. We were lucky to survive. If anyone has any thoughts on how to create a real uh, risk um, algorithm around software testing, I would love to hear it. In the meantime, let's talk about how to do the, the testing that we've decided we need. So big part of testing is provisioning, creating a system under test. And that's going to be a, a place where your application can run. Remember, that's application, not microservice. Uh, and then we're going to run our test against that isolated environment. And so I'm going to show you some different ways to do that provisioning with some different pros and cons. What are we optimizing for when we're trying to create that system under test? We're optimizing for the big six. Let's take a look. First of all, fidelity. How close to prod is this environment that we're creating? We want it to be as close as possible to give us the most predictive value. But then the more and more it's like prod, probably the more it costs and the harder it is to spin up. So there's a balance to be struck there in terms of fidelity. Isolation. We want to make sure that the test can run on its own. Has, everyone had, has anyone had the experience of you're running a test, it's going along, and then all of a sudden, what the heck happened? So you shout across the room, yo, wh what's going on with staging? And someone shouts back, oh, yeah, I dropped the database because I wanted to see how long it would take to restore. And you're like, uh, so now i got to start my test all over again. Ideally, we would like our test environment to be uh, dedicated to our tests and to stay consistent throughout the entire test. Also, preferably, we shouldn't be invoking external resources. 
uh, like production infra or even uh, sometimes uh, testing infra. Uh, because you know, even if you're only doing reads, it's possible to totally brick a service by DDoSing it with a bunch of reads or sending some malformed request. I've done it. Speed, because of course, fast is better than slow. Dora tells us that the time from commit to prod is an essential predictor of DevOps success. So we want fast uh, testing infrastructure. And after we've got speed, we want more speed. Because no matter how fast you can make an individual test run, if you've got a lot of people on your team, you're probably going to want to have more than one uh, commit being able to be tested at the same time. Uh, if you've ever been sitting watching a long-running test, well, that's really annoying, right? But now think about if you're sitting watching someone else's long-running test and you're stuck in the queue. That's infuriating. So we want to be able to scale and have parallel testing. Ephemerality. So this means that how long does the test infrastructure last? Ideally, we want it to last as long as we need it and no more. So that would mean as soon as the test is over, it should disappear. Maybe. Because if it passes, we got our green check mark, great, off it goes. But if it didn't pass, we might want to go into that infrastructure and poke around in it to see what went wrong. So sometimes on a fail test, we want our test infrastructure to hang out for a while. How long? Now that's hard to say. We want to hang along, out long enough until we're like, I probably won't go in there and look at that. It's old news. Uh, I tend to think in terms of hours. It could easily be in terms of days. Probably not months, because by then, it's no longer relevant. And finally, cost, because of course. Uh, we want to constrain our costs on testing. First of all, because we don't want to spend more on testing than it's really worth. Also, ideally, we can recognize the value of our test infrastructure, which means it's really great to have some of that cloud-like elasticity so that our test costs are aligned with how much we're producing in terms of code. So I'm going to show you this microservices example. Uh, now, this is an application that has two microservices. But we all know the only numbers are 0, 1, and infinity. So this is an application with infinite microservices. It's a cookie store, um, and it has two layers. Each of these layers can be spun up and tested individually. But if you spin up that web layer without the database, what you have is an empty storefront with no inventory, no cookies. If you spin up the database without the front end, what you're going to have is a bunch of inventory, but you can only talk to it through SQL queries. Now, people in this room might really like ordering their Christmas gifts over SQL, but you're probably not going to get a ton of customers. And we really want to give cookies to everyone. Take that GDPR. So let's look at how we can test both of these services together in an integration test environment. Uh, if you want to play along at home, you will find uh, the repo here at this URL, along with test configurations for both Google Cloud Build, I work on this product, I should know its name, Google Cloud Build and Jenkins. So what we're going to do in, is we're going to show you multiple ways to run through this kind of integration test. And they all use the same basic flow. First thing we do is we build two containers, a web container and a DB container. Then we provision a test infrastructure. We put our web and DB services into it. And then we're going to run an integration test. And this is a simple test that just greps the front end and looks for a, uh, a particular string. In this case, it looks for the string chocolate chip. Happens to be the best cookie. There will be no argument about that. If it passes, we're going to deprovision that infrastructure. And if it fails, it's going to hang around, depending on the me mechanism that we use, so that it can be debugged. So here are four ways that we can run through this application. The first use is Docker Compose. Uh, any folks here ever use Docker Compose? Yes. I usually get a fair number of hands on that. Docker Compose is a great lightweight way of stitching together Docker containers. Uh, developers like it because it runs in the same Docker environment that they've been probably using and has a simple configuration file to stitch these things together. In this context, what's going to happen is this entire build machinery is going to run within a single VM instance. And that means it's very fast and uh, and it, it uh, also, at the end of the, uh, of the run, the entire thing is deprovisioned. So you never pay for any orphaned resources. Downsides of using a technique like this is Docker and Compose is not Kubernetes. You're not going to run your production in front of Docker Compose, probably. I've seen it done. It's kind of not recommended. Uh, so you're going to have two different configuration files, and that can drift. 
Um, and also, um, you have the challenge of educating people about maintaining multiple things, kind of heavy. Um, and the other problem here is that ephemerality issue. So it's great that we would never pay for an orphan resource. The hard part is that we can't go in and debug against it because at the end of the build, it's gone. So let's try something that can maintain through an external resource. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to deploy uh, against an actual Kubernetes cluster. And this gives us really great fidelity. We're talking about real Kubernetes, just like our uh, actual application runs on. Because everyone's applications on Kubernetes now, right? Like I said, this is an example just about Kubernetes. The same techniques uh, apply no matter what. Um, so in this case, what we're going to do is do our build, and then we're going to create a namespace within our, our shared cluster, deploy our services into it, run the test, and at the end, we destroy the namespace. And one nice thing about Kubernetes namespaces is if you destroy the namespace, everything in it disappears. Modulo, I just learned this afternoon, certain persistent volume mounts. We're going to gloss over that. So um, the benefit of this is that it's really fast, and you have really good isolation, because by default, items within a namespace won't reach out and talk to each other. So there, it's like its own little world inside the cluster. Really good fidelity, especially if you're running your uh, production cluster in the same way as your Kubernetes cluster. I'm, of course, using Google Kubernetes Engine. Um, and cost is relatively constrained, especially if you use like an auto-scaling. This staging cluster is going to scale up and down according to your need. Downside here is we don't have perfect isolation uh, in the sense that these namespaces do live all in the same Kubernetes cluster. It means there's possibility for them to stomp on each other. Also, you can't test anything cluster-wide. So if you're doing something like a Kubernetes custom resource definition, or CRD, or say you wanted to test your software against different versions of Kubernetes, this isn't going to work for that. Uh, yeah. All right. So what if we wanted really great, uh, oh, that's what I wanted to mention on this one, is that um, you also have that problem that at the end, uh, your namespaces could hang around. You could have a lot of namespaces uh, as orphaned if you have a lot of failed tests and you never go in and clean them up. So if we wanted something that would clean itself up, we can use a self-destructing VM. What? Okay, self-destructing VM is a VM that destroys itself. And now this is useful because a VM costs money even if no one's using it. And if you spin up a VM for every single test, you're going to end up potentially spending a lot of money on orphaned resources. So this is a technique that lets you make VMs that will turn themselves off. And the way that works is when it starts up, we set a timer. I used to usually set mine for about two hours or four hours. At the end of that timer, the VM is going to make an API call. It's make an API call out to the cloud API, and it's going to say, hey, I want you to delete instance XYZ, and XYZ is my name. So then the cloud comes back in, and poof, I'm gone. If you're interested in playing with your own self-destructing VMs, you can grab a bit.ly link here. So we're going to use that self-destructing VM to spin up a Kubernetes environment. Now, this is just one little VM, um, and we want it to be kind of fast. We don't really want to deal with it in full Kubernetes. So what I'm going to use in this case is something called uh, K3S. Uh, there's other versions of this called MicroKates, Minikube. Uh, I think there's a couple others. These are Kubernetes-compliant runtimes that can fit onto one node. And uh, what they do is they eschew some of the older APIs, some of the more advanced technology, uh, advanced features, they don't scale the same way, but they're great for CI because you get a proper Kubernetes API interface in a single VM, and it spins up fast. So in this case, we're going to provision that VM, deploy to it. Now we have an isolated Kubernetes instance where we can manipulate the entire instance, like do CRDs and stuff, run our tests against it, and then if it worked correctly, we're going to deprovision it. If it didn't work correctly, we can go and debug it. If we forgot to debug it, it's going to destroy itself. But what if we wanted to go all the way? Perfect isolation, perfect fidelity. Could we create a Kubernetes cluster for every single test? Yes, we could. I was surprised to find out how, uh, how workable this was. So you can do this routine where in every test, you spin up a Kubernetes cluster. This requires, I think, something like a Kubernetes engine. Uh, though I suppose you could script it yourself with Terraform. In fact, that should work just fine. You can spin up a Kubernetes cluster, run your stuff against it, and then destroy that entire Kubernetes cluster. This is not that much slower than running uh, against the VM or against the uh, namespace per test option. But it is, of course, a little slower, and it's going to cost more. Um, and, um, and you're going to have that orphaned resource, which is going to be even more expensive than an orphaned VM. 
So comparing all of these techniques, you can see there's a lot of different ways to create a Kubernetes or other sophisticated runtime to use as part of your test. They all have pros and cons and trade-offs. There's really no single best answer, except there is a single best answer. Uh, most cases, I believe, the best answer for this use case is going to be that shared staging Kubernetes. The namespace isolation is really pretty darn good, and in most cases, it's going to act as that each test is in a fully isolated environment. Um, with that auto-scaling, you're going to have really great cost constraints. This is the fastest of the uh, choices, uh, modulo Docker Compose, because it's got um, the infrastructure is already provisioned. And you know, while most of the time I would really be loath to say everyone should share one big instance, again, the isolation is really good. Um, and if you ever have a problem, of course, further down the line, you could do something with even higher fidelity, like spinning up a whole Kubernetes cluster. Uh, I was in an open space, I think it was yesterday, and someone described exactly this technique. It sounded like they were happy with it. So, Dave, this is cool and all. But what if I have lots of services, like actually uh, infinity or maybe dozens, hundreds? It could get really slow to spin up all my stuff. And the answer is yes. And so you may be that you want to take some of your services and mock them out or stub them out or have a long-standing uh, service running as a test endpoint, perhaps for stuff that doesn't change as much and you're less worried about getting the freshest version in every single test run. Dave, what about state? Everything's got state. The database is the hard part. You know, in my example, I showed you running a database inside a container as part of the test, but you're probably not running your database inside Kubernetes. So options here include you could use something like a database as a service and spin up a database externally and then turn it down, or you could have a standing database. That can be tricky where you know, people stomp on each other or schemas need to change, but it also can be a good compromise. Uh, a big challenge here uh, is about database size, where if you want to have a really good test, you actually want a database that's of the size of your production data. That's going to take forever to spin that up and spin it down as part of each test. So more likely, you're going to want to have a test data set that's smaller. Maybe towards the end of your test, you do something where you have a true you know, 10 terabyte database that you're testing against. But Dave, what about PII? Now, this is a tricky one. The highest fidelity test is going to be one where you run against an exact replica of the production data with all the user stuff in it. Probably a no-no in most industries. Is that okay in insurance? Is it cool? No, not so much. Not so, not so cool. Uh, this one's a hard one. Um, you know, a really like, high fidelity practice would be to do something where you export data out of your production database, run a sanitization script on it, and then import that into uh, a staging or, or, or test environment. And you could even script that so that happens regularly. But that's kind of hard. And you're going to have to ask yourself, is it worth it? And really, that's the kind of question I want us to be asking with integration testing. Not, do I have to? But what's worth it for me? I know I can do it. I know there are pros and cons. I'm going to figure out what's my sweet spot. Should I fire everything up into prod and just uh, hope that it works? on a wing and a prayer, you know, deploy it all and let the users figure it out? Or should I take my time and test every last little bit over and over again until I'm completely sure that it's perfect before I let it out into the wild? The right answer is probably somewhere in between. And we each have to find our appropriate balance. When you figure out yours, I'd love to hear about it. So please tweet at me or chat with me. And that's my time. Thank you.